Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we are going to be talking about uh, best practices uh, for indoor mobile mapping. Um, we've got an awesome case study here uh, uh, with Precision Point using the Navis scanners and uh, uh, really looking forward to this one. Uh, so uh, we're going to go ahead and get rolling here uh, since uh, we've got a, a good crew online already and uh, do a little housekeeping uh, first though, just so everybody kind of knows what's going on. So uh, if you go and hit to that next slide, James. The um, couple of key points here, uh, everybody is muted. So uh, you know, we're not gonna be able to hear you uh, if you talk, but uh, please ask questions uh, uh, via the chat uh, during the session. There's a little questions area. You guys can go plug in your questions. Uh, when we get to the end uh, of Q&A, uh, then I will uh, be going through those questions and asking them of our uh, of our uh, presenter. Uh, and uh, we've got some uh, backup as well from Navviz if there's any questions about the equipment. So uh, Merrick will be here to uh, answer some of those too. Um, we are recording the webinar. So uh, no stress if you have to drop out early, uh, if your uh, kid runs in on you and there's an emergency. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know that happens during COVID so uh, don't worry we are recording we'll be happy to uh, you know we'll be sending it out to everybody actually to register so uh, that'll come out in about two weeks and uh, uh, just uh, watch your email if that's the case you'll uh, you'll see the invite to that video when it launches and uh, with that let's do some uh, quick introductions here so um, we have got with us today uh, James Watt uh, project manager of Precision Point, uh, and, ah, and I get barking today. Uh, excellent. So uh, first, first uh, realistic uh, COVID uh, webinar moment of the week. Uh, so James, why don't you do a quick introduction? <laughs> yeah, hi everybody. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, appreciate uh, you having us today. Um, <clears throat> been here uh, working with Precision Point uh, for a little while now. Uh, been in the industry for a couple of years and um, really came from an engineering background um, operations and and uh, scanning so a lot of scanning experience in the field and um, I'm excited to, to share you know this case study um, with everyone today and a uh, fun fact if uh, Kelly if you uh, ever uh, want to talk about laser scanning at 6 a.m feel free to call I will be wide awake uh, due to the cats uh, jumping on me for their breakfast. So happy this, to this is, uh, take your early phone calls. This is this is why I have dogs instead of cats now, James, because I do not like waking up early and my dog is perfectly happy to sleep till 10 a.m. Um, so uh, I've, I've chosen well, apparently. Um, awesome, uh, glad to have you with us, James. Uh, I am Kelly. Uh, I uh, obviously with ClearEdge 3D am responsible for our industry strategy. Uh, do a lot of work with the US IBD, uh, spent a lot of time in the industry on the BIM VDC side before joining ClearEdge. Um, and uh, yeah, if, if you don't know me, uh, you know, you'll, you'll learn that I, I play guitar moderately well. We'll, we'll, we'll leave the, uh, the, I don't know who put poorly here. I'm kind of offended. Paula, I think you jumped in and changed the slides just to throw me off. It's, it's a good play. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, with that, James, why don't you uh, take it away? Let's uh, let's take a look at this awesome project that you guys have done. Yeah, so um, you know this is this is a, a relatively you know simple project in in terms of. Um, you know, laser scanning practice. And uh, I wanted to share it though, because it was a great example of how we combined uh, several tools and took advantage of uh, the, the wall extraction in particular uh, with the ClearEdge software. Uh, so this was actually a, um, a large um, 100,000 square foot um, space that we scanned. Actually, it's, it, was, it was larger than that, but we only scanned 100, a thousand square feet and um, really just a typical office space you know with a cube farm and uh, this space is going to be renovated for uh, some new office and research facilities 
So they did not have up-to-date as-built drawings on you know, both the, the architectural uh, layout as well as the uh, MEP. So ultimately the customer uh, was delivered uh, point clouds, the indoor viewer as part of the NAVIS deliverable with the mobile scanning, uh, an LOD 200 model. And throughout the project, we were able to deliver pieces uh, as we went along. And, and I'll talk a little bit about you know, how this, uh, this project was divided into a few areas just to simplify coordination, communication, and um, file size management. So the, the customer wanted to capture this, this space and you can see on the right, uh, just a portion of it, um, all of those gray dots representing uh, photographs that were taken by the mobile system. Uh, the customer wanted this space uh, captured very quickly because the overall uh, project or our scope of work had a uh, eight week timeline um, for all, all deliverables to be processed and uh, generated. You know, something very typical in laser scanning, we look at a lot of these projects through um, maybe like a basic egress plan or some type of old um, as built to get a sense of the layout of the space and the square footage. And of course, you know, this is, is no different. Um, the walls and way that the space was chopped up was of course different than, than we anticipated. Um, it's a little bit of the expect the unexpected, right? So um, you think that you're gonna have some, some wide open areas just you know, filled with cubicles and that's it. And as it turns out, a lot of these areas have some you know, partitions that were installed, um, areas broken up. So it just changes a little bit of your plan um, when you get there. And of course, just uh, navigating, getting yourself oriented. You know, I was out on, on site a few times and I know the very first day, you know, everything looks the same. Um, it's just rows and rows of cubicles and it's easy to, to get lost. So, so that's, um, you know, just one of the things that comes with, with scanning a lot of times. Uh, let me let me know, Kelly, if uh, if if there are some questions that pop up as as we go along yeah. here. Yeah, we'll do. Um, and of course, uh, I mentioned you know the the layout, and of course, the piping was another another piece um, of this project because you know being an office building, we we expected you know some pretty basic um, you know fire suppression and and typical utilities overhead. Um, but one thing that, that changed the dynamic a little bit was just that this building had been through several uh, renovations. So when you're talking about, you know, 100,000 square foot area and, you know, we would start in one area, pop the ceiling tiles, take a look around, uh, determine, you know, yes, this is a good spot to take a scan or no, there's some HVAC you know, totally obstructing your view. Um, so we'll move move down to a separate, you know, area. And we can usually start to predict um, how quickly we're going to finish the, the tripod scanning on site. And um, unfortunately, though, when, when, we, when we got into some of the other areas, um, we had some different configurations just due to some of the uh, renovations that had taken place over the years. So, so um, you're saying the site conditions weren't exactly what was expected or showed up in the the drawings that you bid on, James? That that never happens, right? <laughs> yeah, never, never happens. I, I, I've learned I've learned um, maybe the hard way to, uh, like I said, uh, expect the the unexpected um, at many laser scanning sites. Um, and and oftentimes, you know, the, the client may have not been on site either. So, you know, that's part of the part of the challenge, or and part of the reason they're scanning, quite frankly. 
So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, the project in particular, just to kind of frame up our approach here. So initially, you know, this this project scope kind of changed a few times as we were as we were looking at it in these different areas you see outlined here, and um, eventually it was it was decided that you know yes they they needed the whole gamut you know the architectural uh, the MEP so we we opted to do a hybrid approach um, on this project in which we would scan the above ceiling space with terrestrial scanners you know essentially traditional methods <clears throat> and then uh, utilize our m6 uh, scanner you know our mobile system to take care of the you know the entire architectural space getting the some of those extra details in rooms and things that um, when we're focused on above ceiling we're really not concerned about you know those those other items it allows our crews to just focus on the task at hand um, and gives us a chance to um, use some of the other tools associated with the NAVIS system uh, so what you see here um, is just the basic this is essentially the scope that i was given uh, during the bid phase and you'll see um, all these different colored areas marked and uh, the customer had uh, had these these areas already laid out. So, from our perspective, we said, well, let's just use the same naming conventions and uh, kind of break these areas down as we track our field notes um, and just track our day-to-day -day progress. So, throughout this this project, um, we decided, you know, we're going to start with the tripod scanning. That's going to be the bulk of the time, and we'll use that to um, set up a coordinate system that we can then use as SLAM anchors to tie the mobile data to. So we had several hundred scans that were taken because we we're extremely thorough uh, with these uh, above ceiling scans. And we were out there uh, for about 20 days, uh, most of the time with, with just one technician operating uh, two machines. And during that time as well, um, kind of making their plan for that mobile capture. Um, we of course had to lay out those, those slam points ahead of time, which in this case, we simply utilized adhesive checkerboard targets. And so uh, we picked those up during the, during the tripod scans. And then when we got to the point where we had all of that at least laid out, uh, we were able to bring an additional technician out while we continued on the uh, tripod capture and start running the uh, the mobile system. Uh, real, real quick about, uh, oh, you, know, you may be hitting it right here, but uh, in, in addition to the scanning time, about uh, how much time did you guys spend uh, post-processing uh, getting yeah, all that so, data ready to model with? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, and one of the one of the key um, takeaways today uh, has to do with, you know, kind of my focus on reducing labor hours, right, on on these different tasks. So, you know, of course, the, the tripod scanning is, um, you know, fairly time intensive. Of course, we can mitigate that running two machines. And um, and then, of course, some back office processing. So our, our office processing on the tripod side is about um, 20 to 30 percent of, of the site time. Um, we estimated that if if we were only focused on you know architectural capture and i'm only talking about the scanning at this point you know we would have spent uh, and i break this out um, a little later but we would have spent approximately 80 80 labor hours total associated with that and so with the with the mobile system we actually spent more time i think talking about what we were going to do than actually uh, uh, doing it. So one technician, uh, eight hours on site, 
was able to uh, mobile map this entire site, which was just over 100,000 uh, square feet. Yeah, it's, it's one of the things that I've heard before from people is that uh, because I think people are less familiar with mobile scanning methodologies and techniques that, you know, it's it's really important to, you know, do a lot of planning for it um, so that you get the best results. And, uh, uh, you know, whereas people, I think, are just used to terrestrial scanning. And, you know, once you've done a couple, you know, 20, 30 projects, you can kind of plan on the fly almost. But with the mobile scanning, that the, the the project planning is crucial to getting good results, and uh, that you know, but it's easy to spend that extra day doing planning because the capture is so quick. Yeah, I, I definitely agree, and I think um, you know the other advantage to to completing the tripod piece first, and we could have we could have done it either way, um, but because we hadn't seen the site before, um, it gave our crews the chance to you know, maybe kind of change their game plan based on what they saw on site. You know, hey, we'll we'll do this a little different. We'll lay this out um, a little bit better. And then and then when we complete the mobile capture, you know, it'll just go that much smoother and that much quicker. So um, definitely some some advantages there. Um, additionally, and I'll I'll actually uh, share just a brief preview of the, the indoor viewer on this site, um, which is an especially useful tool. Um, while people are working from home or unable to visit sites, um, either because of the, the pandemic situation that we're in currently, or uh, simply because it's far away and um, you, know, you wanna manage your project budgets and save some some money so you can take advantage of these tools. So here you can see, um, I've already logged in. You would have a username and password. You can password protect the indoor viewer. And um, and then just take a simple virtual, you know, walk through around the site. It's very, uh, very easy to use, very intuitive, and um, you can just you know navigate around the site. And these are the key maps that I shared earlier um, that you were able to see in the uh, in the slides in the beginning. So you can see those you know how many um, pictures we took on site in addition to that that data uh, capture. This is a great collaboration tool. You can take notes, you can share the URL based on um, just where you're at to, to get somebody to zone in on a location. And uh, just for some, some context here, you can see that adhesive target that we placed and we just had that right in the path. And you can, and you'll see here, um, there were several, um, when I showed, showed my pictures here, you could see kind of the path that we took. So it was hit multiple times by that mobile system. Jump back in here. So, you know, the indoor viewer was was one of those tools that we were able to deliver to the customer um, and they could start getting getting familiarized with the site because many of the people working on the project like us um, hadn't visited the site or weren't familiar with with it. So data capture, uh, we talked about um, fast forward to you know, completing that and getting into the stage of, you know, now we're now we're going to start processing these files, uh, some of which we we began doing, you know, after tripod capture was completed, and um, now we now we're looking at this massive area to model, and uh, we think, well, gee, you know, the architecture ought to be faster, you know we should be able to get that done much quicker. So let's go ahead and we'll run 
you know, these files through the, uh, the Edgewise software by uh, ClearEdge and um, get, these, get these walls extracted. So now we're able to do some hands-off processing where we can bring in uh, that, that point cloud file that we've captured, that unstructured PTS uh, from the uh, M6 and just walk away from that system while that, that runs. And um, based on the areas we had broken, uh, broken the site into, the, uh, the automated portion was anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour. Um, and I think we ended up with about uh, eight to 10 different kind of breakouts that we, that we did because some of the areas we cut in half. And uh, the beauty was, is that we could do that, let that run overnight when people are not in the office so that we could, you know, leverage our, our resources most efficiently, our licenses, and, um, you know, just take advantage of that computing power in, in the, uh, the off hours. Now, once that, that auto extraction piece, um, which we also use for the piping, but once that is complete, um, we do some cleanup with the walls and uh, I've got some videos here at the bottom. You know, you can see a few things like a door that was open and a couple of scans um, was picked up as a wall and, um, you know, just some connections that need to be made. We're, you know, filling in uh, some of these areas here. This is super simple to use. Um, if I can do it, then I think anybody can. <laughs> Um, you know, and it's a great way to uh, help, uh, help, you know, with this project load by uh, having some other folks, you know, help out with, with this extraction. See, we had some, uh, it looks like my chat windows uh, flashing. Uh, did we have have any questions there, Kelly? I was gonna take them at the end, but uh, yeah, we got we got a bunch of questions coming in, but we can oh, okay. save most of them for Q and A. Very good. I'll keep going. Uh, this is just kind of a, a preview of the tool. You've got another good one here. Um, kind of shows shows it a little bit cleaner with the uh, the points turned off, so you can see this is again just one one small segment. This took about 30 minutes to auto extract. And uh, you'll see here, I believe I turned the points off. So now you can see, you know, all those areas and you, you can go in and connect these walls, clean up, either remove um, walls that shouldn't be there or add, um, add some that were you know maybe missed in the auto extraction the beauty of this and the one thing i was really impressed by especially in this environment was that um none of the none of the cubicle walls from what i had seen in the auto extraction were um detected as as walls um so that was pretty impressive to me because i would have anticipated that uh, to have been you know one of the things that would have gotten pulled out of this uh, auto extraction. Yeah, it's it's it it our algorithms get cleverer every every year. <laughs> a little bit at a time, man. A little bit at a time. Yeah, no, it's 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 been awesome, you know, speeding that process up. Uh, so I talked about, you know, delivering this model in phases, you know, allowing that, that customer to get started sooner. And, I, and a little bit on uh, the capture side as well, you know, the mobile system truly saved us, you know, a ton of hours. We estimate approximately 10 days in the field, um, given, you know, just the, the size of the space. 
Uh, again, this was captured in eight hours with that mobile system. And uh, the other thing that I really like about the mobile technology here is we can use that as an opportunity to just focus on getting those extra photographs that you know help the users that may not be as familiar with point clouds um, using that indoor viewer platform and uh, you know getting additional point coverage on uh, walls that's going to make all of those things easier to identify and uh, then we're going to really be able to take advantage of using all the tools at our disposal including the the edgewise extraction as far as the uh, the modeling time as opposed to you know manually what i'll call a manual extraction going in and in revit and uh, doing some some tracing of the point cloud if you will um, we had, we had estimated that we would have saved approximately three weeks of of labor time by taking taking advantage of you know leveraging the hands off auto extraction for you know for one and then also um, just you know doing that that wall and that pipe cleanup um, being able to keep you know lots of folks productive and uh, contributing to the success of this project. And it's 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 kind of a, an interesting thing because with the mobile scanners, um, you know, the data doesn't look as crisp or you know as as clean as as a terrestrial scan scanner just in terms of the localized noise in the data, right? But yeah, as you mentioned, you get much better coverage because you don't have all these shadows. Um, but it's it's kind of an interesting thing where I think most people that have modeled from a point cloud in a tool like Revit. Um, you know, you getting the wall drawn doesn't take much time, but making sure that it's accurate enough, but not too accurate, <laughs> um, you know, that's where you burn a lot of time. And the same thing goes with piping systems, right? You know, you draw the pipe in and it's flat and then you have to go and tweak it and lift one side and get the slope. Then you have to, you know, adjust the endpoints and make all the fittings and connections. And it's, it's that kind of work of, of getting the model to the LOD that's required, um, to the kind of accuracy that's required, but doing it carefully so that you're still kind of operating within the, you know, uh, the expected tolerances of the software that you're using, uh, that you spend a lot of time doing that work uh, if you're doing all this stuff manually. And it's just, it's a very different process, right? Using these kind of automation tools because they'll put it in, you know, accurately with you know however you know however abstractly you want it to be but they'll get it in accurately from the get-go um, but then there's other steps that you end up doing trimming walls things like that that you know you wouldn't have done if you were drawing manually but it's just it's a it's always neat to see kind of the comparison of the two workflows um, but it's just two very different types of uh, two yeah. workflows and models yeah, definitely um, different strategies, you know, for sure. Um, and again, you know, Kelly mentioned this earlier, just with that, um, you know, that planning element, which is really important regardless of, you know, the tools you're, you're going to use, but um, it helps for everyone to understand, you know, what direction we're gonna take on the project. Um, yes, we're gonna use, you know, some automated extraction tools, so, you know, let's bear that in mind. You know, as we we uh, handle our coverage, you know, we want to we want to use the tool successfully, but we don't want it to necessarily replace, um, you know, people thinking and making you know sound decisions as they move through a space. Yeah. Oh. And uh, and here you can see, and we talked about this, but the the breakdown of uh, you know the the time savings, and again I can't I can't stress this enough, um, not just on the um, the capture side, but also on the the modeling side. You know when you're eliminating labor hours with some hands off time, you're just leveraging your resources so much more effectively we can be more efficient um, we're able to share that efficiency with our clients um, not only in 
you know, price, but just at the speed at which they may receive um, either final or progress deliverables. So it's, you know, it's really just about using every tool as effectively as possible and, um, you know, keeping, keeping the project on track. Fantastic. And actually, I have a question uh, that came in that's related to this. Uh, obviously, you have the terrestrial scans and the mobile scans. How did you guys register those together? You know, were they geo-referenced? What, you know, what's targets? What software did you use? What was that stitching, uh, you know, that you guys ended up doing? Uh, how, what yeah, was that so, work? Yeah, no, so I appreciate that. I'll, I'll uh, share a little more detail. So we were we were utilizing you know, uh, Faro. X and S series for the, the tripod capture. And we uh, registered that data uh, through you know, traditional methods using scene software, um, putting those scans together, validating quality registrations, um, you know, with typical workflow utilizing spheres uh, to tie those scans together. And then those um, checkerboards that I showed earlier. And uh, we've got a picture here. Uh, we used those as the, you know, the the anchor points, if you will, to tie that mobile data to the to the tripod data. And so the image in the in the bottom right, you can see I've made some little yellow circles on all those different adhesives that were laid out in this one particular area. And we just pick up that that checkerboard in the uh, in the tripod scan uh, it has a x y and z value that we can then export from Faro scene and we do that for all of the checkerboards that we uh, will capture with the uh, the mobile system the mobile system has um, basically a laser plummet that we center over that target and capture that specific point as we move throughout the site and then on the back end um, we take the coordinate file from ferrocene and uh, we uh, export that as a txt a text file and then we just apply that to the uh, the mobile system as a as a slam uh, slam based registration now this actually helps us in two ways because not only were we able to um, tie the tripod data successfully, but because we had multiple data sets, um, it also reduced um, and really almost eliminated any of the manual registration associated with moving data sets, um, you know, data sets around from, from the mobile system. So again, we were able to to use that to gain some efficiencies as well. And um, just a, you know, sort of some, I would call these, you know, tips and best practices. And these could be good questions that, um, you know, architects and engineers may ask their laser scanning provider things to think about. Um, is having a color scan important to them? You know, of course, with the above ceiling, you know, you're not going to typically have very good lighting conditions. So color may not be an option in those cases. Um, but in some of these other areas, you know, with with the mobile system, it's especially useful to have have those color photographs. It really helps people just wrap their head around the site, uh, makes it more um, as if they're there, you know, and in in real life so to so to speak so um just a simple question to to understand that as well as what are the what are the accuracy needs what uh, what are the elements that the customer wants to model um in this case you know an lod 200 model is is fairly basic um so you know that being said if the customer wanted to utilize the photography uh, to look at sprinkler head locations or um, light locations for the purposes of some 
you know, demo plans, um, they could take advantage of that. Um, but they may not necessarily need, you know, built-in casework modeled. Um, so those are important things to to share with, you know, your your scanning provider. Definitely. Um, yeah, and just and just think about, you know, how you want to align the data up front. Um, in this case. You know, because the customer didn't have anything proposed that was developed yet, they didn't have any existing CAD files. Um, it wasn't necessary to align it to a model, but um, we wanted to give them something, you know, that was that was usable. So we d we used that coordinate system, and then um, you know that data was then oriented as you see on the indoor viewer um, to the general orientation of the of the building. Awesome. Well, do we want to go ahead and move into Q&A? I'll take that as a yes. You read my mind. It's amazing. <laughs> um, fantastic. Well, we, we do have a number of questions pulled up here, so let me uh, let me start blowing through these. Um, and as a quick reminder, if you joined us a few minutes late, the whole thing is recorded and we do send it out uh, at the end. Uh, well, we send it out about a week or two after, so we have time to clean up any weird audio stuff uh, that may have happened, uh, like my dog barking at the beginning. Um, but uh, yeah, with that, let's get on to uh, the questions. So, um, Let's see. We got a question about whether the project was multi-level, and uh, so, so did you guys end up spinning, spanning multiple levels on this one? Uh, so this was this was just a one-story building. Um, gotcha. But if if it was multiple levels, um, you know, how would you have tied the floors together? Would it be through total stations? You know, setting uh, setting up those controls. Uh, you know, control on different floors, static scanning slam anchors. Uh, you know, what would you guys have sure. done for that? So in this particular case, because we were using you know what I'll kind of call that simulated slam, since we're you know we weren't shooting it with a total station, I would have I would have carried that practice through in the same way. I would have um occupied uh some upstairs points you know with, with those checker boards um tie that in with the scanner and and just treated it you know the same way i treated things on the first floor but really leveraging um those hard points if you will those checker boards to tie the the separate floors together um in this case as opposed to you know maybe like a visual or cloud to cloud based alignment between stairwells. Awesome. All righty. Um, great. Uh, we've also got, um, let's see, uh, can you kind of briefly share about how you differentiate, um, you know, materials uh, when you get to the modeling phase or um, you know, systems? I know you've mentioned this is, uh, you know, mentioned photographs. Uh, you know, is, is that helpful for doing that? Yeah, so of course, um, the photographs, you know, are, are useful on, um, you know, all the, the architectural pieces. You have, you know, some nice high quality color imagery. Um, so that's usually uh, not an issue. A little bit more challenging is getting into the above ceiling uh, where it's dark and, um, you know, you're dealing with essentially a, a, a grayscale simulated image from the uh, the scan data. Um, so we usually can tell a little bit of, you know, what is there. Of course, you can identify, you know, duct work and things, um, not only just based on the shape, but you'll get some, you know, reflection off of it. Um, so you so you know, you know, what you have there. Um, and then as far as systems are concerned, we we typically when we're in the field, if we have the ability and opportunity, um, you know, we pop that ceiling tile and climb up that ladder, there, um, there's pipes that will have labels on them, you know, especially if it's a newer, uh, newer space. Um, I know in particular that uh, the one area I spoke about earlier, uh, there was um, a bunch of piping coming through there that was, that was labeled. 
I was able to do some extra scans in that area to help, you know, plan ahead and supplement that the back end work. Awesome. Um, and I've got a question here from Merrick. Um, so uh, Merrick, do you have to stop moving the NavVis card at each of those locations? You remember the, the picture that had all the little gray, uh, uh, the 360 images, are you stopping the cart there or is you, do you just keep walking or something? Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we recommend stopping uh, just so you don't get blurry photos. More advanced users, you know, they learn in the field when you need to stop, where you don't need to. Essentially, if the, if the room is well lit or you're outside, uh, the camera doesn't need as much time to take a photo, just a very short split second. So you can slow down, take a photo and keep rolling. But if the environment is dark, and then you want to stop so the photos don't get blurry. All right. Fantastic. Um, let's see here if there's anything else uh, uh, popping up for Merrick. Um, ah, well, he, he, this is this is a this is a good softball for you, Merrick. Uh, can you can you tell us what SLAM stands for? Yep. Uh, SLAM stands for Simultaneous Localization and Mapping. And this is what's pow powering up our scanners that they can build the floor plan and position themselves in the floor plan all while you're scanning the building. Yeah. And and do you uh, to do that? Do you need to close the loop, uh, or or do you recommend you know closing the loop uh, on on the paths that you take uh, the trajectories mm -hmm. with the scanner? Yeah. So there's no need to close the loop, even though we recommend closing the loop because each loop closure improves accuracy. If you cannot close the loop and it's a large building and you want it to be as accurate as possible, then we recommend scanning control points that act as essentially nails in the point cloud tying the data to the survey control. Gotcha. Yeah, I was, I was, I was gonna ask you about survey control next, so I already answered that one for me. Fantastic. Um, all right, let me jump back over here to a question or two for James. How much uh, how much time did y'all spend doing QAQC on the automated extraction? Because that is that's one of those steps that's a little bit different uh, because the algorithms are never perfect, and you know there's there are always those false positives like doors, and so you do spend some time cleaning those things up. Um, about how much time do you guys you think uh, spent on that? Yeah, I would say um, it's a you know, there's a couple of steps where where we're going to you know continue to review that data. Um, initially, you know, within Edgewise, we're probably looking at um, you know maybe two to two to four hours, depending on the size you know that we extracted there, um, to extract some additional ones that maybe were missed. You know, clean up. Um, clean up those doors, you know, things like that. And then of course, you know, when we bring all that into Revit, um, there's gonna be another another check against the point cloud data um, because when you're doing that, uh, when you're doing that automated extraction relatively quickly, um, you may, you know, you may put a wall over a door um, or you might just miss it completely. So. Um, it's kind of built into that the modeling process that already exists, but I would say um, no more than a half day for those typical uh, small small areas. Um, and we probably had, like I said earlier, um, about eight of those areas. Awesome. And uh, I got a question about the wall extraction. Is it automated or semi-automated? Um, uh, in Edgewise, uh, and the answer is, uh, we released a new version of Edgewise building, uh, gosh, about six months ago, five months ago, that uh, now supports full automated extraction for unstructured data as well as structured data. So um, you can now do the uh, the full automated processing uh, with uh, mobile scan data, which is part of what prompted this webinar. Uh, so if you're an Edgewise customer and you haven't used it, uh, used the building product in a while, uh, come go take a look. There's a lot of improvements in it. Um, Merrick, I've got another one for you here. Um, basically, oh shoot, I lost the question. Where did it go? Oh, there it is. 
Um, is it necessary to use the ground targets uh, for control points with the NAVIS system? Um, and if it's not necessary, what's the difference in accuracy, you know, using those things versus not? Yep. Um, so, yes, yeah, so far, it's not necessary to use accuracy. And in smaller projects, using ground control wouldn't improve accuracy much. In smaller projects, I mean, floor plates less than, you know, 10,000 square feet. Uh, we have our own precision slam that is very robust. If you're scanning a large building, you know, in mobile mapping, it's the accuracy is a slightly different thing than in static scanning, and uh, because you have local accuracy and global accuracy. For the M6, our accuracy is LOA 30 standard, which means it's anywhere from one to five millimeters locally and five to 15 millimeters globally, meaning across a building and could be an airport shopping mall, a huge building. If you tie in data to survey control, you can preserve local accuracy more throughout the whole space. So you're essentially preserving that local accuracy over the whole building and you eliminate drift that might occur on a very large project. Yeah, that's a, that's a great way of describing it. I noticed you tied into the US IBD uh, LOA standards there. So anybody on the webinar that's not familiar with the US uh, Institute of Building Documentation, uh, US IBD's got some great uh, helpful documents for understanding scanning accuracy, for specifying it, uh, as well as for modeling accuracy from scan data. So go, go check out their website uh, if it's new to you and membership is super cheap. Uh, so, uh, you know, get access to those resources for very little money uh, from your firm. Um, and then I got another question here. Uh, uh, so, so Merrick, uh, can you also use the SLAM anchors with the new NavVis VLX, or how do you register uh, the VLX cloud? That's a, maybe a little explanation for people on the call what the VLX is uh, as well that aren't familiar. Yeah, sure thing. So, yeah, definitely VLX is a hot subject right now. It's our brand new uh, wearable scanner. Uh, so something between a backpack, something between a handheld that was released just last week. Uh, and uh, one of the new things here is that the new scanner can take floor targets as well as the wall target because you, it's got an IMU. It knows exactly how you tilt it. You can tilt it any way you want and touch it against the wall, against the floor, or anywhere else your control point might be. And anything can act yeah. as a control point that you can measure. Do you, you do you have anything maybe you want to show real quick, just uh, just for people to kind of see it? Oh yeah, I'll be more than happy to show a couple of screenshots, and maybe some. All right, yeah, here let me make to, let me make you can share my screen. Yeah. Sorry, so James, I took it away from screen. you for a minute. And let me know if you can see it. And just to be clear, that is not a laser scan. Yep, that is my hometown <laughs> that I miss a lot. But yeah, uh, so definitely, you know, great presentation and, you know, the workflows from the M6, uh, which is, you know, a very powerful device. VLX is not a killer for the M6. It's more of a complementary tool because, as James was explaining, M6 doesn't fit everywhere in the building because of its size. The VLX is a device that is much easier to carry around much much more mobile you can essentially take it anywhere where you can walk you can take it off your shoulders put it up above some pipes you put it up the ceiling put it down underneath other pipes around the equipment so it's essentially like an oversight handheld that happens to be more accurate than a regular handheld would be and creates much more quality data so you know taking a quick look of how our point clouds look like we can start with a little one minute fly through video from right outside our headquarters in Munich, Germany. So this building that we see right now, this is where our office is located and this is where we took uh, one of our new scanners for a spin to see how it captures outside. So you can see it's good enough to scan facades up to probably six, seven stories. It's still called VLX IMMS which stands for Indoor Mobile Mapping System. I guess that's the industry jargon. Nobody came out Indoor Outdoor Mobile, <laughs> mobile Mapping System acronym yet. But yeah, it doesn't matter. You can scan inside, you can scan I outside. Just, I, I think you just coined it uh, IOMMS. So there we go. 
It rolls on the tongue, you know. <laughs> no, this looks really good. I, I haven't seen this yet. I know you guys have a. I think you guys are doing a webinar next week or something, or maybe this week with uh, um, with Spar 3D. Uh, yeah. I think showing this off, but uh, yeah, this looks really cool. Yep. So on um, next week on the 26th, we have a webinar hosted by Spar 3D, as you said, where our CEO. Felix and our head of sales, Ben, will be doing official, let's call it, I don't want to say launch, but showing it off to uh, anyone who is interested to see the workflows, how does the scanner look, how does it work, and what type of data it produces, because you know, compared to other handhelds in the market, it's uh, definitely you know, 2020. And when it comes to point quality, you can see a paper towel roll being left on a kitchen table right here in our office there. And, Know, individual plants on the leaf on the right side of your screen uh, so that we are, we are very proud of the point cloud quality we can achieve would be alike so anyone who would like to join that's part of the webinar more than welcome to come cool beans well i'm, I'm gonna send this uh, back to uh, to james here in case any of the other questions uh, pop up and then we've got uh, i'll take questions for about two or three more minutes and then we'll we'll uh, we'll call it a day um uh and then, yeah, if anybody's got more questions about VLX, uh, you know, reach out to the team at Naviz or hop onto that webinar. Um, uh, looks like a really nice piece of kit. Uh, so, so James, back to you. Um, what was your, uh, you know, did you guys go and check kind of your total error? Uh, and, and also, what was your total error goal? Uh, and then I think also we've got a bunch of people asking about uh, how did you get above the ceiling tiles, uh, just in terms of registering them and uh, uh, stitching them together uh, within those kind of error expectations or accuracy expectations. Want to take a crack at that? Yeah, no, that's a that's a good question. Um, so we uh, we we promised in this case in, in LOA twenty. Um, however, we we know that. Um, uh, not through this project, but we have run in-house tests uh, to validate um, levels of accuracy with the mobile system compared to um, tripod data that was captured. And in particular, when we're using the SLAM, which in this case, we utilize those checkerboard targets, we will uh, be able to maintain and achieve the same level of accuracy um, that we achieved with the with the scanner. So as long as we've done our job correctly with the tripod scanners, uh, we know that we'll achieve LOA 30, and uh, the uh, the maximum error, of course, is going to carry through to uh, to the mobile system. So the same as it would if you know a surveyor had shot a point, um, or you know you did have an accuracy. Um, you know, out of tolerance that would carry through. So um, in this case, we, we would have achieved that LOA 30 um, through the through the use of the, the SLAM and, and tightening the accuracy with proper loop closures, which our technicians are always doing uh, regardless. Um, the second question you asked about um, ceiling tiles. So, um, you know, with this building, this is typical ceiling height. You know, we were able to use a, a step ladder, pop this, the tile off to the side, and we have some uh, simple telescoping tripods that we use. Uh, we basically break the plane um, where the scanner is slightly above the plane of the ceiling tile and uh, slightly below. And then we use uh, the area below to place some spheres or checkerboard targets and use those as our registration points. Um, we also, of course, in some cases, will place spheres up above the tiles, but typically uh, we like to use the areas below because it's uh, it's easy to leave some spheres behind when you're in a large space and you're putting them up, you know, above the ceiling tile. And spheres are expensive. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they are very expensive. All right. 
Well, um, I'm going to I'm going to call it a day here. We've got a, a bunch of other questions that have come in. I certainly don't have time to answer them all. Um, we will try and follow up with people afterwards uh, with with answers to those questions. So uh, if you didn't get your question answered, we will uh, we'll do our best to get back to you uh, pretty quickly. And uh, again, please uh, feel free to reach out to you know, any of us, uh, obviously, uh, uh, contact James at Precision Point if you guys have, uh, you know, uh, questions or interested in having them uh, come take a look at a project for you. Um, any questions about Edgewise or uh, the kind of scan to BIM process, uh, reach out to myself or uh, just the Clear Edge 3D in general. And then uh, on, the, on the acquisition side, uh, you know, any questions about the M6 or the VLX or any of the uh, awesome uh, software NavDiz has to view that data, uh, like Indoor Viewer, to uh, reach out to Merrick. And uh, with that, thank you all so much for listening and sticking in. And uh, we will get that recording out in about a week or two. And so uh, look look for the email uh, uh, to anybody who registered. And if, if somebody else uh, is interested in getting that recording, tell them they can always go register uh, after the event. And we'll send that recording to them as well. So. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you so much, James, uh, for your time putting this together. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. And um, thanks for inviting me and, and uh, we're happy to be here. All right, thanks everybody. Adios. Thank you guys, bye.